Hi, everyone. I'm Yasmin Vesugian. In for Allison Morris, you are watching NBC News Now. Here is what's happening at this hour, an NBC News exclusive. The vaccine is efficacious uh, against this, but it doesn't mean we let down our guard with uh, people, students in particular, who are not vaccinated. The Biden administration's urgent push to get teenagers vaccinated as the fast-moving Delta COVID variant spreads across this country. And upgrading America's infrastructure, what exactly does that upgrade include? And who's going to pay for it? We take a look at how infrastructure changes are affecting low-income communities. The, the fact of having a chicken meant that you had eggs, you had uh, you know, a means of sustaining yourself, and possibly you had a means of earning money. Telling the story of emancipation through food, we're going to show you what's on the menu for the country's inaugural Juneteenth holiday. We start today, though, with the Biden administration's push to get more shots at arms. NBCNews.com White House reporter Lauren Egan is in Wilmington, Delaware, with President Biden. Lauren, good to talk to you uh, once again. Let's talk first about that goal, right? So the president announcing they've administered 300 million shots in 150 days. More folks need to get vaccinated across this country. Some states having a lot more folks vaccinated than others. What's the president saying about trying to hit that mark? Yeah, that's right, Yasmin. The president gave a speech just a few hours ago at the White House, and he struck a really hopeful tone. I mean, just think about where we were this time last year. Our lives look entirely different in terms of what we're able to do. But he also warned about the Delta variant and pockets across the country where vaccination rates continue to be low, warning that these areas were vulnerable to this variant. Take a listen to what Biden had to say at the White House earlier. Folks, we're heading into a very different summer compared to last year. A bright summer. Faithfully, a summer of joy. On July 4, we're going to celebrate our independence from the virus as we celebrate our independence of our nation. We want everyone, everyone to be able to do that. Let's remember, we are the United States of America. Let's get this done. Yasmin, the White House has set July 4th as this goal to really open the country back up. The White House is planning their own big 4th of July celebrations, and they're really encouraging people across the country to use the celebration as a moment to get back together with your friends and family. But Biden warned, unless you are vaccinated, this kind of big celebration really just yeah. will not be an option for you, Yasmin. So the vice president is part of this effort to get more shots at arms in as many Americans as possible. Uh, she was in Atlanta uh, earlier today to talk vaccines. What was her message out there? Yeah, that's right. The vice president is leading the, administration, the administration's efforts on getting more people vaccinated. She was in South Carolina earlier this week, Atlanta today, and she's really visiting communities of color to try and address some hesitancy, skepticism, or distrust when it comes to the vaccine. Here is what she had to say today in Atlanta. But there are some people, a lot of people, who might say, I haven't been vaccinated yet because I'm just not sure. You know, I'm hearing all this stuff and I don't know what to think. They may question the safety or the efficacy, the, 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 does the vaccine work? And, and they may have heard things that aren't quite true. And so let's arm ourselves with the truth to arm them with the truth. Yasmin, Harris has talked a lot about how she got the vaccine, how she, you know, she felt a little bit sick at first, but that was it, and how she was able to see friends and family and how it kind of changed her life, even just being able to have more of her staff work in her office now that people are vaccinated. So she's really tried to address the, the safety and the effectiveness of these vaccines during this bus tour to get more people vaccinated. Yasmin. I, I got to say, the number one reason that I've been hearing from folks as to why they're not getting vaccinated and all my reporting as I've been across this country, the number one thing is I need to wait and see. I don't trust the vaccine. That's what so many folks are saying, especially in some of the regions in which they're not necessarily getting the information that they need from inside of their community and the people that they trust. So so I think kind of the big question here is if the president doesn't reach this goal of July 4th, what's the plan? 
Yeah, it, right now it's looking like they're not going to reach their July 4th goal, Yasmin. But the White House has said they're going to continue chipping away at getting more people vaccinated. They're not just going to stop these efforts after July 4th. But, you know, we've talked about Harris's efforts in communities of color. And while that's one chunk of it, another part of it, as I'm sure you know from your travels across the country, is a lot of Republicans and conservatives in more white and rural communities, mm. perhaps people that supported President Trump, that are not, you know, they're very skeptical of this vaccine and say they're not going to get it. Now, the White House has acknowledged that Biden and Harris perhaps are not the most effective communicators and messengers when it comes to these sorts of communities. So I think their challenge going forward is going to be finding people they can work with to reach out to these communities, because I think that's where, where we're going to see a lot of the push come uh, in post-July 4th. Yasmin. Lauren Egan, thank you. All right, to an exclusive NBC, uh, the Biden administration is currently um, looking to uh, launching, excuse me, a new effort to get teens vaccinated, including what they're calling a national student corps. NBC News correspondent Heidi Prisbilla has more from a vaccine site in Washington, D.C. Hi, Yasmin. The primary way that the Delta variant is spreading in the U.K. right now is through secondary schools. Dr. Anthony Fauci says we cannot let that happen here because it is hitting their teens hard. And yet I'm here to show you exactly why this could very well happen here. I'm here at one of the biggest vaccination sites in the District of Columbia with the capacity of vaccinating up to about 800 people per day. And yet we've only seen a trickle of individuals coming in here where you get checked in and then again over here at the actual vaccination site. This is a problem because it is not as if we have huge vaccination rates among teenagers in this city. Yes, the city overall is hitting close to that 70 percent number, but the numbers for teens, Yasmin, are anemic. We're talking about 15 percent overall and 5 percent when you're talking about just black teenagers. We had an exclusive interview with the Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Sarah, and a student at a nearby high school that really illustrates why it is so necessary for the administration to step up to the plate and try to target teens for greater vaccination numbers. I feel like it'll take someone that we trust, um, an influencer, to tell us that this vaccine isn't going to harm us. You know, I need. I think they should, you know, debunk all the rumors and the, you know, conspiracies of how the vaccination is quote-unquote harmful, or it will turn us quote-unquote to zombies. They just have to make sure that they're hearing the right information, and that's where we come in to try to help. And that's why we hope that this new student corps that we've established of student ambassadors will help us communicate to that population of young people who hasn't yet gotten vaccinated, but we know is approachable. And Yasmin, NBC has learned exclusively the details of this push by the administration to target teens. It has to do with everything from social media influencers, including mommy bloggers, because it's often the mamas who bring their teens in to get vaccinated, to a new student corps that the Health and Human Services Secretary hopes will encourage kids to reach out to their peers. We interviewed the director of this center, and he said, look, the time has come and it's gone for these types of mass vaccinations vaccination sites to reach these teenagers. Going this final mile is going to be a lot harder when it comes to reaching the vaccine hesitant, because a lot of these kids either don't think it's going to affect them or, surprisingly, they've bought into some of those co uh, conspiracy theories that that young lady London talked about just now. All right, so the highly contagious Delta variant sparking concern in places with low uh, vaccination rates, like in Missouri, where only 37 percent of residents are fully vaccinated. And health officials say they're finding the rapidly spreading variant in the state's wastewater. NBC News correspondent Elson Barber is in Brookfield, Missouri, for us. Elson, great to see you this afternoon. Thanks for joining us on this. So health officials there are telling you the Delta variant is showing up in sewage systems throughout that state. What are they seeing there? Yeah, I mean, they've been testing wastewater since the pandemic began pretty much. But they say that right now what they're seeing as it relates to the Delta variant is that not only is that variant prevalent in this state, 
but that it is particularly prevalent and spreading really fast in smaller, more rural communities where less people are vaccinated. They first identified the Delta variant in wastewater in Branson, Missouri on May 10th. That's about four hours away from here. But within that same week, they identified it and detected it in wastewater right here from this plant in Brookfield, Missouri. The University of Missouri is working with the state's health department to take samples of wastewater from wastewater facilities all across the state, because not only can they detect COVID-19 in the wastewater sewage, but they can also specifically identify which variants are there. And by looking at it in terms of each facility, they can identify specific communities where they're starting to see some sort of spike. Right here in Lynn County, they only have about a third of their population vaccinated. And health officials here are hoping that the fact that the Delta variant is spreading here, it serves as a warning for people who are not vaccinated just yet. At one point towards the end of April, mid-April about, There was almost no COVID-19 detected in the wastewater here. Then last month, mid-May, that changed, and they've seen the detection rate steadily increase in the last two weeks or so at the wastewater detected just from this facility in Brookfield. Yasmin? Hey, Allison, how quickly is the Delta variant spreading there? Really fast. We were talking to the virologist who is part of the team of scientists evaluating and going through all of these wastewater samples at the University of Missouri. And he said this is spreading faster than any of the other previous variants, particularly among the unvaccinated. Listen here. Since about the second week of May, we've seen a very large increase in the prevalence of the Delta variant or the uh, used to be called the India variant in Missouri. And the speed at which it spread is, is quite amazing. It spread really quickly through the state. And health officials have been saying it for months, but they are re-emphasizing it in this state and in counties like this one right now, that the way to protect yourself, to protect your family, people that you love, is to get vaccinated. The people that they are seeing in hospitals, they say almost all of them are unvaccinated. Yasmin? Well, so so just quickly here, um, Allison, what are they doing there to get more folks vaccinated, to bridge the gap? You got 37 percent, as you mentioned, vaccinated in that state, 45 uh, percent nationwide. In some places like New York City, for instance, 70 percent of the population uh, vaccinated. What are they doing to get more shots in arms, especially in rural areas? Yeah, I mean, there's a big gap here. And and when we talk to health officials, they say they are trying to really make sure that they are communicating with people and dispelling a lot of misinformation that some people have come across read uh, on the Internet. And they also are really trying to take this opportunity as it relates to the Delta variant to sort of have it serve as a warning so people know how serious this is. We spoke to the president of one hospital uh, down in the Branson area in Springfield, Missouri, and he talked about how they are starting to see more and more people in their hospitals. And again, all of them are unvaccinated. They are younger. And one of the things the health official here in this county told me is she said, you know, a a few months ago with the other variants, if one person in a household contracted COVID-19, they could maybe, they could isolate, they could practice mitigation techniques and maybe the rest of their family Mm -hmm. wouldn't get it. You'd have one or two people in a household get it. But now with the Delta variant so prevalent in this county, she says entire households are getting it despite trying to do mitigation efforts if they're unvaccinated because this variant, she says, appears to just be so much more contagious, so much stronger, if you will, that previous efforts to kind of stop the spread internally didn't help. They say vaccination is really the only route to go, and they are trying to just reach as many people as they can. But the numbers show it. It's a really big uphill battle in this state and particularly in smaller rural counties like this one. Yeah. Alison Barber, thank you. All right, CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky, a warning about the Delta variant, uh, that it could become the dominant COVID variant in the United States quicker than we think. Here she is on ABC's Good Morning America. It is um, more transmissible. It's more transmissible than the Alpha variant or the UK variant that we have here. We saw that quickly become the dominant strain in a period of um, one or two months, and I anticipate that is going to be what happens with the Delta strain here. All right, let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, thanks for joining us on this. Really appreciate it. So a lot of folks worried about the Delta variant. How worried should they be seeing that it's more transmissible, as uh, Dr. Walensky 
says. Yeah, I think, Yasmin, if you're unvaccinated, you should be worried. And if you're vaccinated and know people who are unvaccinated, you should also be worried. And by the way, being vaccinated, we think the current vaccines protect us. But, you know, that's something that we also need to see with time. So I'm also very worried that we will see in those unvaccinated parts of the country what will play out regionally will mimic a little bit of what happened last year. You take a strain that's 60 percent more transmissible than the alpha, which was more transmissible than what we had here in the United States a year ago. And that is a recipe Mm. for disaster. I'm also hearing this Delta variant is showing up differently in teens and more so in teens than the original COVID. How concerning is that, especially when you have so many children still not vaccinated? Yeah, I think that what this means is we need to have an incredibly kind of low threshold for testing. Yasmin, and and I'll just say this very bluntly, anybody watching, listening, pass this along, that we're seeing symptoms that are kind of not the typical COVID symptoms. We would talk about fevers, chills or cough and loss of smell or taste in some of the teens and young adults, but also some older adults. Yes, but we're seeing just people who have kind of what they would consider a, a cold or doesn't feel like they're sick quite yet, but about to get sick. And so it's really hard to know. Mm. And so I hope people who are unvaccinated, especially reach out and get tested. And then if you're vaccinated, you still can get the COVID virus. You can't, it doesn't mean that you don't get it. It just means that we hopefully protect you against being sick and dying. So you should also get tested. But Yasmin, we're also hitting into a weird time where we're seeing a lot more kind of coughs and colds from other viruses that we would normally not see, like RSV, a respiratory virus in kids. So this is causing, I think, Mm. a lot of busy kind of people. Clinically, we're busy. And parents, I think, are very concerned. Yeah, I mean, more and more folks are are getting sick yet again because we're now going maskless, right? So we may be protected against COVID, but there's a heck of a lot of other things out there. Uh, that we be, we could become sick with. I, I just want to talk quickly about um, this side effect of heart inflammation that we've heard about in certain teens. Um, you got more than 300 cases of heart inflammation in young people um, after getting the COVID vaccine. That's what they were uh, reporting. Um, according to the CDC director, Walensky, she emphasized these cases are, in fact, rare, 300 out of 20 million young people that have, in fact, uh, been vaccinated. Do we know that there is a direct correlation here between the vaccinations and this heart inflammation? And should parents be concerned in getting their teenagers vaccinated? Yeah, I'll take the last part first. Parents should not be concerned, but they should talk to their pediatricians or doctors about it. By the way, this extends to young adults. And we're seeing this from like the ages of 16 and 17 to like 22 to 25, which is what we would expect with uh, this inflammation of the heart called myocarditis. The, the, kind of to your other question, though, very important. What we're seeing, it, it's not clear if it's correlated, Yasmin, but the truth is that we're seeing more cases than we would expect to see based on clinical trial data. As you point out, though, we've had tens of millions, not just in the United States. We now have other countries, Israel included, that have administered these shots to people around the same age. And to your point, this is an incredibly rare circumstance. It also is self-limited in most cases. The most important thing is that if you have a a 12 to 17 year old and you're debating about whether getting them vaccinated, talk to your pediatrician about Mm -hmm. even considering spacing the first and second doses. Some parents are doing that because we generally see this reaction after the second dose. Another thing to consider if your child or young adult has already had COVID, there might be a reason to only do one shot. So I think there's options, but stress that it's rare. And then let me stress statistics that we do know that uh, two thirds of that same age group that did get COVID ended up hospitalized or ill. So the benefits that way, the risks, I worry as a parent putting anything in my child that could harm them. But let me tell you, the exposure of COVID and a possible Delta variant is far more harm than the vaccine. But have that conversation. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, because I know that they have to do a lot of testing. But th- is there any commonality between any of these 300 or so uh, individuals, teenagers, young adults that developed this heart inflammation. And what I mean by that, obviously, is any kind of underlying condition that they saw amongst these uh, various folks. Yeah, great question. Um, We think it's not across all of them, Yasmin. 
But we do think there's a significant subset of them that might have had COVID before, um, or at least had an asymptomatic infection. And then, yes, we do know that there is a proportion that do have underlying conditions. Having said that, let me tell you, this inflammation of the heart, we see this commonly after other types of viruses as well. So there's also that confounding mm. factor. Could this be? Could this have nothing to do with the vaccine? But as we're getting out and about more, it's another virus. The truth is that, again, we're seeing more than we would expect. So I take that seriously. CDC was scheduled to talk about it today. With Juneteenth, they delayed it. There will be a rigorous discussion about it. But I think at the end of the day, I still feel good about recommending the vaccine. But I would also say parents, absolutely, and young adults have that conversation. And again, talk about the the risks of getting COVID compared to the benefits of the vaccine as we're covering this Delta variant, which does worry me, even in young, healthy people. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you as always. Great to see you, my friend. Let's go to NBC News Now correspondent Simone Boyce. She's following the latest headlines from NBCNews.com. Hi again, Simone. What do you got this hour? Hey, Yasmin, we're going to start in the Middle East. The Palestinian Authority canceling a vaccine sharing deal with Israel. The reason an initial Israeli shipment was too close to the expiration date. The Palestinian health minister says the doses expire this month. And here in the U.S., Roman Catholic bishops ignoring directions from the Vatican, moving forward with a plan to deny President Biden communion because of his support of abortion rights. The bishops voting overwhelmingly to to draft a statement on the Eucharist after three days of debate. Biden is the nation's second ever Roman Catholic president, of course. And switching gears here, taking a hard left, Pornhub, one of the largest pornography sites in the world, is being sued by more than 30 women, accusing the site of violating federal sex trafficking laws and distributing child pornography, among racketeering and other crimes. The suit alleges that the parent company, MindGeek, used non-consensual content to, quote, become the dominant online pornography company in the world. Now, Pornhub is denying the allegations calling them, quote, utterly absurd, completely reckless and categorically false. And over in Atlanta, two black students who were pulled from their car by police last year are suing the city. The lawsuit says police had no justification for pulling the pair out and hitting them with stun guns while they were stuck in traffic caused by protests over George Floyd's death. And this is a talker online today, Victoria's Secret ditching its angels for ambassadors. The lingerie and clothing company launching a new platform called the VS Collective. It's enlisting a diverse group of women, including soccer champion Megan Rapino, actor Priyanka Chopra Jonas, and others in an effort to be more inclusive. The company criticized for years for not including models of all sizes and backgrounds now says it hopes the new VS Collective will build new, deeper relationships with all women. Only time will tell. Yasmin, send it back to you. Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the world, Victoria Secret. By the way, in case you're looking, Simone and I are both totally willing. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and Simone to be an ambassador for Victoria Secret. Thank you, Simone. Good to see you. All right, America's infrastructure, it's a hot topic in Washington and in communities across the country, especially lower income neighborhoods that are getting pushed out by developers and high prices of homes. NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff takes a look at one Los Angeles neighborhood feeling the pressure. Yasmin, President Biden's infrastructure plan and proposal isn't about just building roads and bridges. It's about much more, including creating millions of good paying jobs. But you don't have to wait for a deal in Washington to see that infrastructure and improving quality of life don't always go hand in hand. After decades of talk and with our infrastructure still in peril, this spring, President Biden proposed a gigantic spending bill that radically redefined the term beyond bridges and roads. You're looking at one of the most important infrastructure projects in the city of Los Angeles. And uh, from 40 feet up, it occurred to me that if you're scared of heights working in uh, construction, this type of infrastructure project, might not be for you. As amazing as all this is, traditional infrastructure like this bridge only accounts for about 5% of the spending. 95% is left for everything else. That everything else includes 21st century improvements you might not expect, like high-speed internet connections and charging stations for electric cars. 
but it also includes creating millions of good-paying jobs and combating systemic racism. That's because traditional infrastructure hasn't always helped everyone, especially those living in its shadows, as some worry about this new bridge in Los Angeles. This is going to be an iconic bridge. City engineer Gary Lee Moore invited us here to the top of LA's new 6th Street Viaduct, which cost more than half a billion dollars and was paid for before President Biden proposed his plan. The bridge will connect the upscale arts district in downtown LA with a working class and largely Latino neighborhood called Boyle Heights, already under pressure from gentrification. High up on the bridge, we met Carlos, an iron worker. You guys make a good living? Uh, yeah, we do, we do. I grew up down the street and- Where uh, at? Boyle Heights. In Boyle Heights? Boyle Heights. You still live here or no? Oh no, I live 78 miles from here. How come? Uh, cheaper rent. Cheaper rent? Yeah, cheaper rent, of course. Carlos isn't the only one getting squeezed by development, according to realtor David Silvas, who sits on a local neighborhood council. This community, the idea that you might see a bunch of condos or high-priced rental units go up, who's going to live in them? Is it the people that are already living in this community? Most likely not, no. That's because new market rate housing would cost people who live here more than half of what they make in a year. And when that bridge opens, the situation gets more dire? Yes, 100 percent, 100 percent more dire because this whole region, if not this pocket of Boyle Heights, will be on the map for becoming ripe for development. Here in Boyle Heights, protests against development are common. We met these residents who are protesting a Verizon cell tower being built in a community garden, which the company says is being preserved. I met a guy working on the bridge. He makes a good salary and he says, he can't afford to live here anymore. Exactly. We're definitely seeing uh, an unfair amount of development. Displacement of communities, displacement of neighbors. People cannot afford living in Boyle Heights it's anymore. It's getting too expensive. It's way too expensive. The Biden administration has said that its plan will mitigate the fallout from any type uh, of infrastructure that negatively uh, impacts communities. Uh, and they say they're going to do that by focusing on things like climate change, like racial inequality, even by making clean water. But when you go to these communities and you talk to folks at street level, there is a distrust that is going to be very hard uh, to overcome. Yasmin? So you can see more of Jacob's reporting on infrastructure in his series Street Level USA streaming tonight, 9 p.m. on The Choice, exclusively on Peacock or catch it Sunday at 10 p.m. Eastern on MSNBC. The water that comes out of our tap is something many of us take for granted. But for millions of Americans, getting safe water is an everyday struggle. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk has more on this. In McDowell County, West Virginia, where coal was once king, there are lots of mountain springs. What makes this one so good is Berlin Cooper can drive right up to it. He fills these jugs once or twice a week because back at home, their well has gone bad. What does it smell like? Rotten eggs. <laughs> really? Mm hmm And that's the water that's coming out of your well? It's the water coming out of my well. Yeah. The Coopers suspect nearby natural gas drilling. That's the problem. There's no good water. Up on Bradshaw Mountain, the Stacys have to rely on water from the sky. Burl built this system himself. You're dependent on the rain. Yeah. And it doesn't rain all the time. No, we don't. They can't drink it, so they also buy bottled. How much do you end up paying for water a month? Do you know? I tell you, you get average about $100. $100 a month. Yeah. Is that, it, is that money that you guys have? No, not really. About a mile up the hill is where the public water ends. Why did they have to stop right here and not go down the road if there are people who live down the road? It was my understanding they ran out of funding. No more money. No more money. Cody Eastep is the McDowell County Commissioner, born and raised on this mountain. Would you say people are worrying about water here on a daily basis? Yes, ma'am, I would, yes. There's lots of people in this country that does not know what it is that takes it for granted to go over to their spigot and turn that water on. You never miss the water till the well goes dry. Cody, if they invited you to Capitol Hill, what would you tell Congress about your situation here? I would have to just say politely, hey, look, what day can you all come down in uh, southern McDowell County? We need a tour bus to bring a whole bunch of you people down there. Just bring them in. And 
plan on staying now. The underlying causes of the water challenges here, fueled by economic decline, may be unique, but the struggle is not. At least 2.2 million Americans live without basic access to safe drinking water and sanitation. We invest hundreds of millions of dollars solving this problem for people in countries halfway around the world. But the fact that we're not putting that same level of intention into solving this problem in our own backyard is, I think, shameful. George McGraw's organization, Dig Deep, is one of the only nonprofits dedicated entirely to domestic water infrastructure. Among their projects, helping the homeowners in Kyle Bottom connect to a new system built by the public utility. What was the water situation when you were a kid here in this house? We didn't have the problem. We was growing up, and I don't know what happened all of a sudden. I guess the pipes started corroding, crumbling, not replaced. Elizabeth Mason spent the whole pandemic without reliable, clean water. Soon, she is going to get it. Imagine for a moment that day when your pipes get turned on and you're able to turn that faucet on. What's it going to feel like? (laughs) Yeah, excitement. (laughs) Because when you don't have water, water is everything. America's water supply is at risk. NBC News uh, reporting shows a hacker tried to poison the water at a water treatment plant in the San Francisco Bay Area back in January. And it's just one example of a growing number, as we've seen, of cyber attacks on U.S. water infrastructure that have recently come to light. NBC News reporter Kevin Collier uh, has been following this issue, and he's joining me now. Kevin, great to see you this afternoon. Thanks for joining us on this. Um, So you're reporting that this January hacking, it was actually really easy for them to do. It was just a username and a password needed of a former employee. So so just how vulnerable is the water supply in the rest of the United States when something like this can happen in in San Francisco? Hey, Yasmin. I mean, yeah, that's right. We've got more than 50,000 water treatment plants across the country. And some are really small operations, only serve a few thousand people, only have a handful of employees, which will mean no cybersecurity specialists. And nearly all of them have at least some parts that are remotely controlled. Um, you know, nobody claims that all water plants would become totally unhackable if we just followed, you know, a couple steps on a checklist. Uh, but some of these facilities' security is shockingly poor. In both the San Francisco Bay Area case I reported on for this story. Uh, and the one near Tampa, Florida, that you might remember from earlier this year. In both those cases, a hacker simply had the login credentials for a program that you use to remotely control a desktop computer mm. and were able to mess with the facilities controls that way. Who were the or- what were the origins of that hack? Do we know? Uh, the, the FBI is still investigating both of these. Any idea if the water system, the infrastructure of the water system, was one of the red lines that the president drew with Vladimir Putin at his summit a couple days ago? He did draw uh, the red line for the 16 critical infrastructure uh, sectors that we have as designated by DHS. So in theory, yes. The tougher question, I think, with that is ransomware, which usually ransomware actors are operated, they're they're criminal gangs. You know, they, they operate often within Russia's borders and don't get punished by the Russian government, by the Russian you know, law enforcement. Uh, and Putin and the Kremlin will turn a blind eye. Will this make you know, Putin kind of send that message down the line that we're not going to do that anymore if you target critical infrastructure? Uh, maybe that's asking a lot. I, you know, we, we've yet to see. Why is water infrastructure, why is it a target for hackers? I think a lot of it is it is so vulnerable. I mean, there's so much that we don't know. And one of the you know things I found tracking down the story is it's not that I I don't know or or there isn't you know there's something that hasn't been made public yet. Nobody knows, and nobody has any way to know how the cybersecurity posture of our water sector in general is. There's never been a federal audit of all fifty thousand plus drinking. Uh, uh, water plant security. They don't. There's no joint meeting. There's no industry group where all the plants go together. Or there's no, you know, nobody who's saying, "Hey, can you prove you all know what a strong password is?" Or can you run a diagnostic to prove there's never been you don't, anybody you don't want in your systems? Nothing like that. It's these are all independent entities, often nonprofits, and mm. you know, that's just hanging by that thread. 
Wow. Kevin Collier, thank you so much. Thank you. Time to get that European vacation back in the books. The EU Council recommending member states lift travel restrictions on tourists coming from the U.S. NBC News correspondent Claudio Lavanga has more. Yasmin, today's decision by the European Union doesn't necessarily mean that Americans starting from tomorrow can book a ticket to anywhere in Europe without uh, facing any restrictions. What it means is that the European Council has recommended all European countries and all members in the European Union to lift travel restrictions for all Americans and importantly to all Americans, including those who haven't been vaccinated yet. But they, these, re these recommendations need to be upheld by individuals countries that which can divide, can decide individually uh, to introduce some sort of condition of entry and one condition of entry that they have used even including here in Italy is uh, the requirement of a negative covid test before they board the flight and of course before they land here so the advice the, the advice I have I've got here is to check the travel advisory and travel restrictions for each country for the country in Europe that Americans want to travel to or countries <laughs> if they are traveling to uh, several of them, uh, which probably will be updated in the coming days in view of today's decision by the European Union. Yasmin. So today, Iranians headed to the polls to vote for a new president in an election the Biden administration is watching closely. NBC News Tehran Bureau Chief Ali Arouzi has more from Tehran. Today, Iran is heading to the polls to vote for a new president. While surprises do happen, the only real shock here would be if Ebrahim Raisi, the hardline judiciary chief, doesn't win. The scales tipped in his favor by the ruling establishment. His campaign posters dominate the streets of Tehran, outnumbering what's left of the competition. His potential victory poses a certain challenge to the U.S., an austere man devoutly loyal to the Islamic Revolution, staunchly and proudly anti-American. Raisi is unlikely to follow President Rouhani's West-facing approach. The tone will change. Hostility will probably spike. But a desire to return to the nuclear deal will remain. It just may be negotiated differently and will likely take longer. Hardline candidate Ali Reza Zarkani, who's pulled out in support of Raisi, summed up the conservative camp's attitude to the deal. He told us, we want it, but we don't need it. Rouhani begged for talks and tied the economy to the JCPOA. The political system here knows that whether they like it or not, they need the JCPOA, otherwise known as the Iran nuclear deal, to work in order to kickstart the economy. But unlike Rouhani, who wanted to open up the country to foreign investments, Raisi's camp want to trade oil but keep the door otherwise shut. Almost all other hardline candidates have dropped out in favor of Raisi. The only competition still standing is the reformist candidate and former governor of the Bank of Iran, Abdul Nasser Hemmati. I spoke to him at his election headquarters, and he had an ominous warning about a Raisi presidency. He told us the economic and social situation in the country will worsen. Social freedom is my biggest concern. People deserve to live as they desire. Raisi's campaign is promising to stamp out corruption and tackle poverty, but a dark cloud hanging over his past tells a different story. He's accused by Western powers of playing a central role in the execution of thousands of political prisoners in the 1980s. Given the vetting system here, elections have never been particularly fair or free, but there's always been a sense of competition and choice. This time round, however, it feels more like a selection than an election. There's been no real campaigning, no real competition, and that lack of enthusiasm is reflected around the ballot box. Life and politics are often turbulent in Iran. But these past four years have been particularly tumultuous. With sanctions, lack of economic prosperity, hyperinflation, deadly protests, a near war with the United States, assassination, sabotage, and a pandemic that's still out of control. All of these have given the Iranian people a collective sense of melancholy. But some here believe if conservatives take full control, they may be able to change the country's fortunes. 
Whatever the outcome, a diplomatic challenge for President Biden is certainly on the horizon. All right, Ali Arouzi is joining me now from Tehran. Um, Ali, great to see you, my friend. Talk to me about the turnout. Um, from what I'm hearing, it seems as if they've had incredibly low turnout um, in Iran, and at one point even extending the hours in which polls were open and recognizing that low turnout. What's happening? Uh, that's right, my friend. It was a pretty low turnout. Uh, I, you know, I've covered, this is my fourth election I've covered in, in Iran. There's a very famous uh, polling station in the north of Tehran. It's one of the main polling stations in the capital called Hosseini Ershad. Every year I've covered the elections there. The queues go down the road and round the block. Today, there was barely anybody there. Some crowds had gathered in the evening, but not enough to really make a surge of votes for, for, for an opposition figure. So, yes, there's been a lot of voter apathy. I've, I've, I've gotten reports that we haven't been there, but in the rural areas, more people voted, not as much, not, not nearly as much as they would have. Those votes would favor Raisi, the conservative uh, candidate. So, yes, it, it's been pretty, pretty low turnout compared to other elections here. They did extend the polling till two in the morning from midnight. And that's not because there were huge queues anywhere. That was just to encourage the few gray votes, as they call it, to come out and mm. vote before the polls close so they could garner a, a, a few more votes for their legitimacy. So, so considering Ibrahim Raisi's hardline leanings, right, and seeing that it seems as if, as you said, it seems like more of a selection than an election in that country, Iran has been through so much over the last year plus. I mean, we've all been through this pandemic, but Iran has been ravaged and financially um, they're suffering, suffering very much so. What are the people saying right now about this election? Well, well, there's a, there's a great sense of despondency here, of, of, of hopelessness in Iran. A lot of the people that you speak to that didn't vote and you ask them why they didn't vote, people, many of them who'd voted for Rouhani twice in 2013 and 2017 said, look, they, they voted for Rouhani because he, uh, he platformed on a campaign of of, of, of amending fences with the West, of reviving the economy, of giving people back some social freedoms. Rouhani is a, is a regime insider. He's always played a central role in the Islamic Republic. So people now think, well, he didn't deliver on any of that. And if somebody like Rouhani couldn't deliver on that, what chance does somebody like Hemmati have? And that's why there was a lot of voter mm -hmm. apathy around the ballot box, you know, not because there was some big, you know, campaign outside of Iran for people not to vote. They, they just simply made a personal choice that they thought their vote isn't going to make any difference. And you couple that in with all the reformist candidates that were vetted and then disqualified. It just it just felt pointless for, for many people. Um, uh, and and the few people, you know, the the base that voted for Raisi, they seem to think that he he can turn things around, something that the reformists in this country can't do. They seem to think that if, uh, you know, all branches of power in this country are controlled by the conservatives, they may be able to move the needle. I guess the test will come pretty soon with the nuclear deal and removing of sanctions. You know, if they if they can deliver on that, well, They'll certainly get some bonus points uh, initially when they take over. Well, and now certainly they have an administration here in the United States that's more open and willing to negotiate on um, an Iranian nuclear deal, as they didn't have that over the last, obviously, four years. My friend Ali Arouzi, I'm going to talk to you again um, this weekend. So thank you for joining us for now. The election audit in Maricopa County, Arizona, is almost over. Nearly 2.1 million ballots have been counted by hand. NBCNews.com senior reporter Jane Tim has been covering this uh, from the start. She's joining me now. Um, OK, so take us through this, Jane, because it seems as if you are saying these auditors are now and still reviewing the quote unquote authenticity of these ballots. So what does that review look like? Yeah, so now that they've finished nearly all the hand recount, what they're doing is looking at these ballots under a microscope, examining the paper, looking for some kind of evidence that there's 
They're not the, the ballots that they should have been. They're not the official ballots. They're using microscopes to see if the bubbles were filled in by human hand versus an inkjet printer is one of the examples they were using. But essentially what they're doing here, Yasmin, is they're vetting out conspiracy theories. The idea there might be bamboo in the ballot and they were shipped in from overseas. These are there's no evidence of this. And this is sort of they're conspiratorial, but that's what they're doing. And that should wrap up sometime at the end of next week when they will actually pack out the ballots and wrap up this audit. So you're also reporting that um, another firm could be brought in for a digital ballot count. Why? Yes. Yeah, so after they evacuate this uh, arena, they're considering using the digital images of the ballots to count them all again. Um, they have not really offered an explanation as to why they want to do that. Uh, the audit liaison uh, signed from the state Senate told me that he thought this is, you know, auditing the auditors, doing an extra check. But there isn't really an explanation as to why they need to continue counting it again. As we all know, the actual election machines did do this count on election night. And there's also been this hand recount that they have done. Um, there were numerous audits actually done by the county. There's just no evidence that you need to keep counting these ballots over and over again. But here we are. But here we are, and that's exactly what they're doing. So even with all that happening, Jane, Tim, at what point are we able to, going to be able to wrap this thing up and move on? You know, it could be as late as Labor Day. Uh, despite the fact that this audit was supposed to take a total of 60 days, we are months into it, and we could still have um, many weeks left. Uh, once they leave and, and do this, consider doing this digital review, as we just discussed, they're also going to look at digital, um, the digital sort of databases that they've had off these machines, um, and they're continuing to continue auditing um, as they do. Uh, it's, it's a little complicated, hard to explain because I don't think they've explained it particularly well as to what they're trying to do, what they're trying to get out of this. Um, but we do know that there's yeah. just what no they're evidence they're going to gonna find anything that's going to change yeah. anything. Yeah. And they won't change anything. Uh, but it seems as if I'm going to talk to you again about this. <laughs> this goes all the way to Labor Day. Jane Tim, thank you. Juneteenth is now officially a holiday, so there's no better time to get cooking ahead of the celebration. But what do you know about the legacy behind traditional dishes on the dinner table this time of year? Simone Boyce met up with one chef who put together a Juneteenth menu that tells the story of emancipation. Some Americans may be learning about Juneteenth for the first time this year, but the recipes that have been passed down in black families for ages remind us that food itself can be an expression of freedom. The theme is red. So we have berry hibiscus lemonade, super bright and refreshing. We have a nice hot link, red hot link, so tasty. And you finish it off with red velvet cheesecake brownies. That's Chef Vanessa Parrish, self-taught and trained by generations of Southern matriarchs. So for people who don't know, why red on Juneteenth? Yes, red is a symbol of resilience blood of slaves, there's so much history that goes into this color specifically, and so we want to honor it by making our food red too. It's the symbolism of some of the foods. It's the, the history of some of the foods. It's the tradition of some of the foods. I wanted to learn more about the culinary legacy of Juneteenth, so I called the woman who literally wrote the book on African-American cuisine. And happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, absolutely. I wish I had a glass of red drink to raise. Dr. Jessica Harris is the author of several celebrated cookbooks and High on the Hog, an award-winning book about the foods that define the African-American experience. It also inspired a Netflix series of the same name. Oh, how glorious. With emancipation, people began to celebrate eating eating foods that were foods of prosperity. It's like, how did fried chicken and barbecue, like how did those become iconic celebratory foods? Remember, we think of fried chicken as being everyday and normal nowadays, but if you had a chicken, the, the fact of having a chicken meant that you had eggs, you had uh, you know, a means of sustaining yourself and possibly you had a means of earning money. Black folks as pitmasters goes back almost to the, you know, the inception of barbecue in this hemisphere, in this country, certainly. We have been tending those pits for a long, long time, and 
producing some extraordinary barbecue. I feel like I'm in Louisiana, Texas, <laughs> North Carolina, South Carolina. Like you can smell the South right now. That is packed with flavor. Mm -hmm. It's hot, it's zesty, it's smoky. There's a little bit of sweet with the pickled onion on top. So you've mm -hmm. got the, the classic red velvet, but we're adding the twist with the cheesecake. It's so delicious. All these flavors are working for me. There is a whole new generation of Americans who will be learning about and understanding the significance of this day. Why is food such an important vessel to preserve black history? Well, I think food becomes a very approachable way to talk about things that might be difficult to talk about otherwise. I mean, we all eat, so I think food allows us all, and especially at this time, African-Americans, to have a, a real voice. Cheers! Have a good day. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.